Uh, John asked, I have 20,000 images in my files. Can I watermark them all at the same time? Uh, yeah, we can cover that today. 100% you can. Uh, but but uh, this came up very recently. Uh, the watermark is applied in relation to the per percentage of where it would. This is kind of a hard question. The short answer to this is yes, but uh, when you apply a bulk action with a watermark in ACDC, the location of where that watermark ends up on your image, especially if you've said like, hey, I want it to be about this area of the corner of my image, that is done with in ACDC when you go to apply a bulk action. It is done with percentages, not exact pixels. So um, there will be some slight minor variation in the location of on it by picture to picture. So yeah. Uh, Tim asked, when will you add uh, DJI RAW? You'd have to send me an email. I do not know. All right, let's uh, let's let's get started. Okay, um, let's. We don't need this anymore. Cool. So again, we're going to be today. The topic is what's new in ACDC Photo Studio Ultimate 2020. Uh, what this workshop is not going to be is going to be a look at the core functionality of ACDC Photo Studio Ultimate. Now, uh, we have done these workshops in the past, and what I would do is I would direct you to our YouTube channel, which I've linked in the uh, chat there um, and um, and yeah and check out our, our workshops on uh, like using the software overall but today we're just gonna be talking about the new features um, and we also do workshops very regularly I do them about three times a year where we go over like each mode individually over the course of a couple different workshops and talk about how to use the software so that content exists and it's on our YouTube channel um, and Jill, to answer your question quickly, uh, yes, email me. And I send that feedback straight to our devs and they, they add it to their list of uh, raw models to add. But there's a very strong likelihood that the model that you're asking for is already known and is already being worked on. So, yeah. So the very first feature I'd like to talk about today is, of course, the HDR feature, uh, our high dynamic range tool. So there might be many of you that are familiar with HDR. Um, HDR has become very increasingly popular in the past five to 10 years. And um, it's, it, in this case, what we're gonna be talking about is a process to take a huge group of photos, right? So you could have like, you know, 30 or odd photos and you wanting to um, make a composite image that takes advantage of all of the different frequencies of like contrast and the change of light over those images. So Adam, what does that mean? <laughs> and I'll explain it. So I have a bunch of photos here uh, in this folder, and these are the images that we're gonna be applying a uh, high dynamic range tool to. Now, let's take a look at these images. I'm gonna bring them up in view mode. Um, and the reason why is because it's easier to see the variation and differences between these images um, in view mode. Obviously they're a little bit small as thumbnails. So we have this image here and we're looking at it and we're going like, okay, so there's obviously very, there's elements of this image that have higher contrast. They have, um, you know, more exposure. There's elements that um, that uh, have less exposure. And Doug asks a very good question, and that is, do these images need to be shot with a tripod? Do they need to be still images? Uh, I would very much recommend it. So um, when you're shooting f images for HDR, uh, having there be very little um, like exterior movement or shake uh, is ideal. Uh, and the reason why is because ACDC can correct a bit of motion, but it can't correct all of this motion. So there's going to be a little, if you have some images that have, you know, certain slight variations in regards to uh, like what you're seeing in your image, maybe you got a, a bit more uh, on this side in one image and a bit less on the other, you're, you know, there's a little bit of shake. We can do our best to sort of balance and find the core of those images as a group, but uh, in regards to HDR, I would almost always recommend using a tripod or something that steadies the experience of you taking the photos. 
Um, so in this case, um, did, did that just well, I want to check something for one user here. Yeah, OK. Um, Kira, I might probably try to rejoin. I'm not sure why you're having that visual experience. Um, so, but if we're looking at these images, okay, so I'm going to zoom in on this. And, you know, as we're looking at this, you notice that, um, you know, in our, in our first images, we have a lot of uh, contrast in regards to the clouds that we experience, especially up here. And as I go through these images, what we're going to see is this area become brighter and more blown out in regards to the amount of exposure in this, this area of our image. But to contrast that, if we were to look over in this corner down here, right, like this area was very dark in our previous images, and now we're getting a lot of contrast and detail out of these rocks and even with the, the wood in the foreground here. So if we go backwards and we look at some of our images that were darker, you know, you start to see these areas become a little bit, uh, you know, uh, the contrast is lacking in this area and it's starting to be uh, underexposed especially as we, yeah, we got up here and now we're starting to lose a lot of that. So the purpose of HDR in this case, I'm gonna zoom out again. The purpose of HDR in this case is gonna take, okay, what we wanna do is take all of the best elements of the contrast and, uh, and exposure from our, our, our lighter images and also take some of the best uh, exposure and contrast from some of our darker images in the areas of the sky and the, um, uh, and the rocks here respectively. So we're gonna take that, we're gonna try to get the best exposure we can out of this image, and then we're going to uh, make some changes to this image because it will still need a little bit of post-processing. So let's do that, let's go through the process. It's actually really simple. Um, what I've done here is, so I've taken these images and I've sort of ordered them logically based on darker to lighter. Um, and also what I've done is I've gone in and I've actually made this little notation here, the little red label. And why I've done that is because I found personally that with HDR, uh, it's best to have a bit more severity between images uh, of the quality and the difference of the image. So if we were to include every single individual detail between image, we'd probably get a little bit of a different outcome. And I found that when we have less sample size and more sample difference, it actually is quite a bit more striking of an image. So let's do that way. So basically I've chosen every, uh, uh, for, uh, sorry, every third image here. So. so you can find HDR as a tool within the process panel. And uh, it's just right here called HDR. And so what this would do is this basically operationally controls it from within manage mode. And however, what I'll show you later is that this is also an effect that you can uh, apply to your images by loading them into a stack. And what that does is it brings them into edit mode and then uh, layers them uh, using the, like, uh, the layer panel and then from there, you can make adjustments to your images in the same way. Uh, but I'm just going to use it in manage mode. I'm going to click HDR here. And so what we're going to do is um, it's going to go through the process of loading them and running them through, uh, like, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, let's take a moment here to allow the, the um, there it goes. So basically, it's, it's loaded them. It's going to, um, uh, apply in this case a preset to this image that we can select. Um, the presets in this case are uh, right now we have four. So we have a black and white, a detailed, a dramatic, and a natural preset. So this is sort of like the output that you would that you would select. In this case my preference is to go with the dramatic output um, and we'll do that momentarily. I just noticed there's some questions. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so uh, Wilbert asked, how would you compare the new HDR functionality to that of a dedicated tool like Photomatix? Uh, that's a good question. I, I mean, Photomatix is probably, in this case, is a similar tool that, that does this. But this is probably something that our developers are more familiar with than I am. Um, 
I would say probably send me an email and I'll ask our developers whether or not they think it's comparable as a tool. Um, I just don't know. Uh, Dave asked, doesn't adjust, adjusting highlight and shadow levels do the exactly the same thing? Uh, it can result in similar, similar outcomes. In this case, it, they don't do the same thing, but I think you could possibly get similar results by using that. It's just you will probably lack the contrast where you get the lighting experience, like the, yeah, it edits, should be already in there, but I'll do it again. Um, there you go. I mean, the other thing too about like, in terms of photography editing and keep this in mind, you know, there are a variety of uh, ways to get very similar results, like by using different tools. So just keep that in mind. But in terms of this, I think what you might find as we go through Dave, that this will, um, will maintain so much more detail than just using highlights. Um, Tom asks, do you recommend shooting in raw? Is that much better? For the, yes, for what we're doing right now, I recommend shooting in RAW, especially in regards to HDR and focus stacking, which are the first two tools we're going to be talking about in this web, uh, webinar. So, um, okay, so I'm going to run through the process of um, of applying this dramatic preset. So let's hit OK, and what it's going to do is it's going to align and blend these images. So the alignment in this case is what we, uh, earlier question was like, how close do the, these images need to be in terms of their frame? Well, this is gonna do uh, a little bit of alignment in regards to the framing. Um, and then it's gonna blend these images together, which is the moreover what we're looking for in this, um, this tool. Um, but still highly recommend uh, uh, shooting with some form of stabilization device, whether it be a tripod or whatever for this. Um, the other thing too is worthy of noting is um, there are some, oh, here, we're just gonna, it's gonna now ask us basically how we want to save down this image. And I think in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna select this as a TIFF file. Um, but yeah, what George was about to ask was um, when you have, what you wanna really uh, do with this tool, especially when you're taking photos uh, for the purpose of HDR is you would like to, and this is the case for any HDR tool, you really want to eliminate as much outside movement as possible. Uh, what I mean by that is there's obviously inherent movement in that like your handshake, that sort of thing. But there's also like if your subject, uh, subjects are moving in your, um, in your HDR process, uh, that's going to result in something called ghosting issues. Now there's certain softwares that can apply some degree of ghosting correction. Um, and uh, in, an, in this case, uh, ACDC is, is in the process of adding ghosting correction, but it's currently not available within the product. But in this case, uh, I would just, again, I would suggest that under all circumstances, it'd be very important to just get as much still content as possible. Um, and I'll show you what I mean momentarily when we save down this image. So let's do, yeah. So some, this can sometimes come up in like, uh, like when you have the subject of a tree or something like that, and you have a bit of wind movement or something like that in your image, that's going to change the location of the tops of these trees. Like these are the things that we want to account for. So I'm going to save this image as a TIFF. Um, actually, you know what? Yeah, no, that sounds great. So let's save it. It's going to end up in the same folder. Um, and it'll be applied right here. And then we'll have a look at this image. Uh, this image to me in my, uh, and I think in this case, I would still run it through some corrections. So we'll do that. But you can see based on this image, the, first of all, like the overall vibrance of this image is taken way, way up but we're still maintaining so much detail and especially the clouds and the subsection here. But in order to just tweak this, I would do a couple things. So I would just bring this image into edit mode and I would adjust the white balance personally to my eye. So I would adjust the white balance I'd add a little bit more uh, yellow to, or I'd rather warm this in terms of its temperature. And um, I would probably also adjust the vibrance slightly. I would bring the saturation down. And I generally always add um, a, a, like a, a vignette. In this case, we're seeing a bit of natural vignetting just occur on the edges of this image. Um, 
I'd probably also just adjust the curves slightly as well. Oop, wait, way too much, way too much. Bring that up. There we go. Um, and then, you know, for comparison, that's the vibrancy of the, with the uh, dynamic application. This is just taking that down and just giving a bit more uh, natural experience there. So I'll just get done. Sure, we'll save this. Um, and then let's compare this. Uh, yeah, we'll save this certificate. That's fine. Compare this to that of our one of our original images. Yeah, that's fine. We can flatten this. Um, so with those changes in mind, let's just have a look at one of our middle images and I'll compare these two here. Um, compare images. So you can get a feel for, yeah. And so this is where we're really gonna get a feel for the detail in the images. It's kind of hard to see with, but in this case, especially like I find the areas of this, these, these images that are so impressive is right in here. Um, and it's accounted for a certain degree of water movement in here. Um, but the area in which, you know, you could probably see the most movement is with our subjects in the, there's a little bit of ghosting that exists there. Robert asked, why did you use a TIFF? Oh, I, I mean, for me, it's, I, you know, I'm a graph designer, but I often use TIFFs just because they're like sort of, they're subsequently sort of like the lower end of the file size, but also the generally maintain the highest quality. This is just sort of like a, honestly, like a graphic design holdover for me. Uh, but you, you could easily export this as a JPEG or how, how, whatever format you want. There's a lot of different format options, so. Um, but in this case, you can see that that again, the go, the area that there's so much more contrast and a lot more a light play in the clouds here than any one particular image uh, in our previous examples, and just maintaining such high quality and a lot of sharpness in uh, the granular details of the sand and rocks that you appear that appear right here than again, any one, one particular image. So HDR, again, just to sort of summarize the per, the real, the purpose of this is to take the best elements of several images and fuse them together. Um, and then like all I did there was a couple slight tweaks, you know, like all I did was a slight vibrance change and a white balance change. And I maybe adjusted the curve slightly after the post-processing experience. And that's of course saying too, we went through the process of a, um, you know, a, uh, a, a very, a, like quite a significant change. Uh, we could have easily gone with like a default or to go with a slightly detailed preset as well. So um, with that in mind, let's sort of take a look at some of our other features that we have here. And the next one I think that's worthy of, of talking about uh, because the functionality is very similar in, in how it operates is focus stacking. Um, so I'm going to go into my focus stacking folder here and we're going to talk about what we have here. Um, so I have a bunch of different images that are of this keyboard here. And if we look at these images, you'll notice that the area that is in focus or the subject of the focus changes throughout the image. Um, in this case, our first image, what is clearly in focus here, uh, everyone could probably tell me, and that is like the M, the N, the area at the bottom of our image here. But as we navigate through these images, you'll find that this, the sort of focal point uh, is raised or it changes throughout the image. So that we start to see the area like the M become a little bit more blurry and the area of the G become in focus. And as we go through to the very end of our image, you'll notice the top of the keyboard is what is in focus. So when we go from, in this case, uh, like the tab key, that sort of area that's in focus, and then it, this image is totally and completely blurry in our first image. And the purpose of focus stacking, much similar to HDR, is to take a huge section of our images here and to make a composite image that takes the elements that are best in focus in all of these images and to combine them. So, um, in this case, uh, there is a slight difference from that of HDR, and that is in terms of to, the best way to, to make focus stacking work in this case is to uh, align or assort your images 
in a way that makes most logical sense. So when we were looking at those images, it starts at M and as it goes through, uh, the, the focus changes to the very top of the keyboard, right? Well, we wanna make sure that when we, before we apply, before we go through the process of running focus stacking, that uh, the, our images focal points make sense. They're just like logically, they, they, they follow a pattern. In this case, the pattern is from bottom to top, essentially. So I'm gonna select all these images. And I'm going to, uh, once again, bring them up into the process pa panel here uh, and click uh, focus stack. Um, uh, and I'll click focus stacking and it's gonna remind me here in this case to do what I just told you. Uh, Tom asked, is there a 25 image limit or do you plan to expand that in the future? Um, I do not, uh, I don't believe there's a 25 limit Im image limit, but if there is, I'm a hundred percent sure that will be expanded in the future. I honestly don't know if there is any limit to focus stacking cause there shouldn't be for HDR either. So, um, that may be an email, a question, send me that Tom. Um, so yeah, so in this case, I'm going to run this through the, this process will, so we'll proceed. And it'll again load our images and then they go through the, this in case uh, the most important will be aligning these images. Uh, Wilbert asked, wouldn't focus stacking normally be used for especially macro shooting? I cannot yet see the need where this would be outside macro shooting. Um, can you explain what you mean by macro shooting, Wilbert? And then it's gonna go through the process of blending these images together. And then we will get an output in this case that again, we'll save down as a TIFF or some other format. Um, oh yeah, 100%. Yeah, can be used for anything. I, I macro shooting in this case, meaning like a larger subject than something small in this case, like a keyboard. Yeah, yeah. It can be used for whatever you like. Um, oh, oh, I see what you mean. Shooting pictures with a macro lens like insects. Yeah, I mean, the subjects, uh, I'm trying to think of other examples of subjects. We have, um, when this was going through the development process, I know that they actually did use a bunch of subjects like insects uh, to get the best sort of results in regards to like, especially when you have certain like water droplets on certain elements of like a leaf and then your subject is like a beetle or something. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Um, uh, anyway. But, um, oh, actually, so it came up earlier, like why did you save this as a TIFF? Well, the options in this case are, you can save it as an ACDC file format, a BMP, GIF, various JPEGs, PNGs, PSDs, uh, TIFFs. So there's a variety of different formats you can save it in. Let's just save this one as a uh, JPEG and I'll name it focus stack one. Um, now, when we view this image, just to compare, the difference between the area of focus is way broader than that of any one particular image. So again, when we're looking through our images here, the result is to create something that where most of our image uh, has like a much, much higher range of focus. So if we're to actually use the compare tool again to compare these images, you can see like in this case too, you can see there's a slight change in the, um, uh, it's, it, in this case, it looks like it's taken on a plane where especially where we lose that focus on the top, it gives it that appearance of almost having a curvature to it. And that curvature is removed for the second image. Um, but all of the elements are in focus. So it gives you a feel for uh, the uh, focus stacking tool. I guess I'll probably, one of the things I'd like to show as well while we're in here, I'll just select a couple of these, but um, you can load your images into a stack, I explained earlier, um, which brings it into edit mode and applies them in order. Uh, let's do that. So, and then what it's gonna do is like you can see here, the layer order is then applied. So we have, uh, you know, layer six, layer five, layer four, layer three, layer two, layer one. Um, 
And what's valuable about this is you could go through the process of uh, auto blending and auto aligning um, or focus stacking in HDR. So it gives you the ability to uh, selectively just auto align or selectively auto blend um, or go through the process very similar to how we did um, with the previous set of images with focus stacking in HDR. So this is something you can do both in uh, manage mode and edit mode, if that is your wish. Um, so the next thing I'd like to talk about, which many of you will probably be familiar with, uh, and that is uh, face detection. So uh, face detection was actually introduced in our last release, but there was a huge amount of improvements that were applied to face detection uh, since last year's release. I'm just gonna take a sip of tea here. Um, let's open up a folder with some faces in it and we'll talk about this. Um, so some of the changes that were made to face detection were uh, just overall backend improvements. So like massive speed changes, uh, identification changes. So it has a much more a structured uh, ability to identify faces now. Um, just a question from Ed. Uh, question for later, is there a means in Ultimate 2020 utilize a green screen background replacement in developer edit mode? I know is present in Video Studio. That's a great question. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Email me, Ed. And if it's also something that uh, you would like in the, the software, um, I mean, that's if you email me, that's the best way to get that to the d developers for, because um, it sounds like if it is o omitted, there's probably ways to get that effect in edit mode um, just by multiple tool use, but there's probably a way to smooth that out. Um, so anyway, yeah, email me. I'll just enter my email again in the panelist here. And yeah, and just to, uh, obviously for anybody who's participating, uh, not just for Ed here, if you have any questions, there's going to be lots that I can't answer. Just again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a marketer here. I use this tool and I definitely come from a, a graphic design background. Uh, so I often shoot, um, you know, I shoot emails to our developers all the time and ask questions and, and fi get find out answers for anyone participating in the workshop. Just direct to the developers. Where do you, where else do you get that? Um, okay, so uh, just from a little background of focus stacking, uh, how you bring it up, you go into view mode with your selection in this case. Um, and um, you can, in this case, we have our, our whole uh, folder here of all of our images. And in order to turn on face, fo uh, focus, sorry, in order to turn on face recognition, I would just click this little face show faced outlines button right here. And it will indicate over the course of our images, which faces are in this case, highlighting the faces. And we can add a name uh, to our faces and add it to our, um, the information on our files by clicking the face tool button right here. And so that enables us to then name our subject in this case. So we're gonna go through and we're gonna do that but one of the nice things that was added in ACDC was um, in, in the previously with face uh, recognition and face detection, what you couldn't do would uh, often, we had a lot of feedback and people were like, well, okay, it's, it's naming people that, um, that look really similar to, uh, you know, or it, there's some issues with um, like a name being assigned automatically without some degree of uh, ability for the user in this case to indicate either no or yes to that, right? Uh, the ability for the user to, to uh, essentially approve a named suggestion. So we're gonna start, let's just name some, some people here and let's see how well this functionality works. Um, so Dale, Dale's recognized in this photo. Looks like Dale's not recognized here. So add, let's here, add one here. Emma, Emma's recognized here. Emma's also recognized here and here and here. Okay, let's add one here. Add Megan, Megan's recognized here, here. Okay, 
So in this case, there is a slight variation. In this case, her face is very close to uh, full on. Uh, full on here, it's not very, it's not essentially in profile, right? But in this case, there's enough maybe variation in this image that her face is tilted slightly downwards. It's maybe not sure that this is Megan. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're actually going to approve this image and not deny this image. And the benefit of that is now more facial information has been added to the pool in which to scan someone like Megan in this case. So if we approve this, we're suggesting, okay, well this is now what your, this, this, fa this person's face looks like looking down. So it's actually providing more information to face detection as a tool to better uh, detect in the future. So going through, and again, in this case, we have another photo of Megan, but her eyes are entirely closed. So we're gonna have to approve that image. But the, the benefit of this is obviously, and now that there are opportunities to, instead of just automatically succeeding or automatically failing, there's opportunities to suggest otherwise, to, to go through and have a little bit more creative control over who has applied these names. Let's see if I can bring up some more, some, oops. Sometimes these work so well, you don't need to. Oh, there we go. No, I don't want that. There we go. In this case, yeah, again, bringing it up, there's enough variation there. So we'd be adding more information to the toolbox. So say you have a bunch of names in your repertoire now. I'm just going to go back into manage mode. You can find this information by going to tools and then manage people. So in this case, we have um, our people who we have Dale, Emma, Emma Megan, uh, Rebby, and then we actually unfortunately have the one we goofed on, so we'd remove that. <coughs> and that would remove it from the directory. So one of the other things that was added in face detection is the ability to embed this information. So this information, these, face to, um, these faces are not, um, this is not like a true IPTC EXIF metadata. This is an external, this is a values that ACDC has created. And what we wanna do is we wanna make sure that that information, once it's added to an image, stays on that image. So we don't have to say, um, reapply this information when we go to use the subsequent products, say when ACDC 21 is released or whatever. And also importantly, if you are uh, sharing this with another computer or you're, you're sharing it with another person that has ACDC installed, if they, this information was embedded in, this, in these images, it would be very quick and easy to pull that information and then view it uh, as such. So let's do that. So what we could do is just select any of our images. In this case, we have a whole bunch of images that have these little embedded pending metadata um, uh, buckets. And what that bucket really means is it's just that, in this case, these people are named. So it's now suggesting like, okay, we recognize that these people are named. If you open up these in view mode, we'll see that these people are named but we wanna make sure that we save that metadata to these files so that when these files are shared or when these files are reopened in the future in a different product, uh, that we can project that information and present it to you. So I go to tools, metadata, and then I would go to embed ACDC metadata and we're just gonna embed it in these selected files. And then what it's gonna pop up is two things. Uh, so classic metadata, so ACDC metadata, which includes categories, keywords, ratings, color labels, and other metadata. And then also the one that we've selected in this case, which is ACDC face data, including face outlines and names. So this is what we'd be saving. So what we are gonna do in this case is embed the secondary category right here. And it's going to succeed on all three objects. And like I said, if we were to then be presented in the future where we wanted to pull this information, um, da -da -da, we could uh, 
uh, import ACDC face data. There it is. So when you've moved that information, you've uh, embedded it onto your files, you would simply navigate to tools under the face detection section and then import the ACDC face data from your files. And that would automatically present to you any faces that had been embedded in your files um, as if you had just run through that process. So again, the benefit of this is for when you're moving from product to product, instead of, instead of having to go through the naming process, uh, this applies it to the image and basically adds it to your the, that file's information so that you can utilize it. I think this tool is awesome. Okay, so enough about face recognition. Let's answer some questions here. Um, uh, Tony asks, will ACDC be adding tethering to their program? There's a very strong likelihood that will be the case, uh, but send me an email, Tony, uh, because we really want a critical mass of people that are interested in that functionality uh, to add it to the, 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 to ACDC. So if that's something that interests you, uh, shoot me an email and I will send it to developers and they will add it to the list of people that want that tool. Uh, David asked, no rush to answer. I bought 2019 ultimate this year. Will there be a discounted upgrade path to stay current and gain these new features? Uh, so to anyone who purchases, um, uh, the product, in this case, ECDC Photo Studio Ultimate uh, 2019, um, the upgrade value or is already available to you. Uh, so we send emails fairly regularly, but if you want to just access the upgrade price, I would just log in to your ACD ID and go through there. But a shorter answer is you don't even have to do that. You can just wait. Uh, I think there'll be, we'll start doing some um, offers next month. So, um, bah, bah, bah. okay. Oh, Francis asked, where's the button to add the face? Okay, to add the face name, I'm assuming you mean. Um, that button is just right in view mode. It's called the face tool. It's right here. You can open it up by using shift F as well. That opens up this little name box that occurs here. Uh, if you just want the identification in this case, the, just the box to appear, this guy right here, uh, you would use the show face outlines. It's really just a, Show faced outlines indicates that there is a face and where the face is on your um, your image, and then your face tool is the ability to add and edit names. Uh, Steve asked, any plans to import the face data used by Google Picasa into ACDC? I believe that is the case. Uh, send me an email and I'll we'll send it to our developers. But I think that that is. Um, Dave. Um, Dave asks, can you address how to eliminate background faces not needed, like in crowds or faces in artwork or st statues, but still recognize faces I want? Uh, when you're an image, when you have an image with like multiple people, uh, that come up, you can just hit the X button to remove them from your images. So if you have like ultimate multiple, uh, people that pop up in your images, it's, it's possible to just remove those subjects and then just indicate the person you want. So if I just wanted uh, Haley here, then I could do that. Uh, and it'll obviously remember it for next time. Um, is there or will there be means in Ultimate 2020 in a module or add-on to utilize a cross-platform sharing mechanism such as DLNA? So capabilities like smart collections could be shared across different devices. For example, displaying a collection on a smart TV or portable device. That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to it, so please email me. Um, oh, okay, so Becky asked a good question. This is a component that's obviously uh, a part of, was a part of face detection last year, but while we're here, it's pertinent to, uh, to uh, the, the conversation. So her question is, how do I find all pictures of a certain person tagged? Super quick and easy. You would just click on catalog, and then you would go to, da, 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 let's see here, people. You would open that up. And then you would simply just click on the name. And it'll bring up with every image that you have, um, or in this case, every image of Dale that the, the system was able of recognizing. Yeah. There's Emma, Dale, Haley. I believe also you can smart search too, or quick search rather. So if I was to just search Dale from here, I think, yeah, it would do it as well. So there's a couple different methods. 
Okay, let's move on. That was a bunch of questions about face detection. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. The text tool. The text tool is the next, next subject uh, to talk about. I'm gonna go back into our folders here. Uh, let's talk about it. Um, yeah. So there's a ton of tools that have been added to ACDC that sort of all revolve around the text tool. Some of them are relevant to the, the text tool. Some of them are relevant to just editing overall. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about are rules and guides. Um, so ACDC in edit mode has added now a ruler. Uh, rulers are awesome. I use them all the time, especially uh, in relation to making composite images in edit mode. Um, so you'll see here uh, that my ruler is at the top of the uh, and on the side of our image. And I believe you can just turn this on or off in view mode uh, right there, or control T in this case. So when you have a ruler, you can apply uh, the, the measurement in this case by right clicking on the ruler. Uh, we could apply it in inches, centimeters, pixels, or using a percentage. Uh, D asked, can the face detection identify animals, places, individuals, types of items? Not yet. Uh, it's just faces right now. Um, it, uh, that has been talked about as a uh, feature for uh, later improvement, but currently it's just human faces. Um, but yeah, you can change it. So we'll change in this case to inches, say. Um, and then it'll obviously adjust the ruler as such and present you with, uh, you know, a realistic, let's we'll just zoom out a bit, uh, on how large, in this case, the image is. Uh, when you have rulers in place, uh, it get, brings up the ability to apply a guide. So guides are super relevant when you wanna make um, like very, uh, structured adjustments to your images. Uh, they also allow you to snap elements to guides, which we'll illustrate in a second, but it allows you greater control over where you're placing um, your other images. Uh, if you're gonna be placing images on top of this one, uh, allows you greater control over sort of what elements you're adding and, and adjusting to your, to your overall um, uh, canvas here. So I can also apply a vertical guide. And I believe if I just slide this through, it hugs neatly to the center. So it's gonna suggest in this case, it'll snap to the very center for both. Um, so another component of guides and rulers in itself is also the ability to just straight up uh, change the canvas size, which is previously, in ACDC, you weren't able to uh, actively adjust your canvas size as you were editing. Uh, your canvas size was in relation to your first layered image. So in this case, uh, if we had added, you know, subsequent layers to this, your canvas size was always in relation to your first image. Um, now, uh, what we can do is we can change the canvas size for our, basically all objects that are contained within it. So if I just navigate to canvas or resize canvas from the top here, that enables me to a, a variety of different options. So in this case, I could just change the canvas to, let's go straight, 8,000 uh, by, you know, fourth, uh, let's go 4,500 pixels, and it will adjust accordingly. Um, now in this case, it's all, it's also noted to me that the aspect ratio has not been preserved for this adjustment. And the reason why was because I entered those values, um, those, those as custom values. But if I was to adjust in this case and preserve the aspect reach ratio, I could just pull this to increase in relation to the original placed images aspect ratio. Uh, yeah, Brooke, we're going to get to that. <laughs> um, the other element of this, which is useful, obviously, is the ability to change, um, in this case, the opacity of the, the background. 
So if we were going to, let's just undo that resize. If we're going to resize this, maintaining our aspect ratio uh, and changing, so the opacity has been reduced to zero, you'll notice that now that's been applied as a transparency in that checkered uh, appearance, uh, it uh, exists in the background. And ultimately what that does for us is it suggests that um, everything that exists outside of these two objects, oops, um, is a transparency. So, uh, you know, the images that would appear, you know, beneath this, uh, all of this, this area is, is, is transparent. So it would not appear, or rather it would appear as white if you produce this as a, um, you know, a uh, destructive file type, um, or you could, you know, edit this, this space basically. Um, what's also relevant about this? What's also relevant about this is, um, uh, so Brooke had asked, can you place multiple guides? You certainly can, you can place as many guides as you want. You can also change the guide color, um, which I believe, which is just within the options panel. Yeah, so rulers and guides, which comes up in general here. So you can change the uh, color and you can also adjust the units within this, this area. But so when you have these guides placed, the value of that is that when you're going to adjust other objects, in this case, we have two images placed on our, um, on our, our canvas here, you can stick these elements to specific elements or rather you can stick them to these guides and move them and adjust them accordingly. So you can see that as I move these elements towards the guides, they sort of hug in place, which is super useful. Uh, this becomes so, so, so relevant as you're adjusting. I mean, the other thing that's valuable about this is you can sort of literally define your third lines. Uh, so if you're working with any, you know, if you're editing your image and you, you desire to see visually specifically where those third lines are, uh, that's valuable. I, again, I use these all the time for editing, uh, especially when I'm making composite images. So like, for example, you know, all of the images that we do for like our box art, for example, are all composite images that comprise of multiple different images with often complex masking and all of these things going on at the same time. So uh, before we talk about the text tool, one other thing that's uh, relevant I'd like to talk about while we're in the move tool, you'll notice that, so we have our, our object here and we have selected it obviously and we're, we're in, within the move tool here. Um, you'll notice that uh, we have the ability to assign these objects, in this case layer two, to a variety of different locations on our canvas. So now you can snap these elements to specific canvas locations, but probably more importantly, the canvas location you're gonna be using the most will just be the center, but it enables you to basically apply it wherever you want. Um, so that in conjunction with guidelines allows you to be pretty exact about any content that you're placing within your canvas. So again, all of this just allowing way greater, uh, greater control. Um, Okay, what am I gonna do? Right, I'm gonna delete this. In fact, actually, I'm gonna get rid of some of these guidelines because we don't need them all. Uh, so in order to get rid of guidelines, you would go to the move tool and you would simply select one of your guides and you would draw it off the canvas. You can do this a lot faster by just going up to the view panel and uh, clearing all guidelines. So if I wanted to uh, clear all these elements, just get rid of them all, you could do that. The other thing you can do is you can lock your guidelines. And what that would mean is you would not be able to move them if you're using the move tool. So that enables you to move other objects without interrupting your guidelines. So we're gonna clear all the guides. I'm gonna increase the size of our image here. Oop, did not mean to do that, sorry. There we go. And then what I'm gonna do is let's assign a vertical guide again. It'll exist somewhere in the center here, waiting for it to snap. Dun, dun, 
Uh... Oh, wait, I'm just I'm goof. There it is. Oop. There we go. Um, and then apply another line as well. Oop, seemed to get a vi visual issue there. One sec. Whoa, very weird. Okay, bug. I'll just reopen this file. Um, bugs, everybody. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going through the process of actually adding a text object, but for some reason we're having a little structural issue. Um, and the other thing you can do is while you're in the view pane is you can turn on snap to guidelines or you can also turn off snap to guidelines. So for example, earlier when you're setting an object to, uh, or you wanted to snap to one of your guidelines, you could turn that off if you didn't want to interact with those sort of objects. Uh, there we go. Um, anyway, long story short, that's a lot of information about guidelines. We're gonna make use of them right now because we're gonna be adding a text layer. So text, has been massively changed. Um, so in the past, text was a component of the filter menu, um, but there was, it was totally destructive. And the goal that we wanted to really address in this release is to make text, much like every other functionality within edit mode, non-destructive when you save the uh, file as an ACDC file. But the other element that was really valuable of us about changing the text tool was that um, uh, w when you're working or while you're working um, um, with the text tool, uh, being able to uh, edit a different object or change something else and then come back to that text and adjusting it again within the same session was huge, hugely important to us. So, Let's just add some text. So all I did there was, actually let's just do it again here. All I did was select the text tool uh, from, the, uh, from the top menu bar, which exists right here. And I just select it anywhere on my, um, my, my canvas. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to control A to select all my text. And let's, uh, let's change it. Uh, Got a really corny quote. There we go, beautiful. Um, now this has changed where my text exists. It's now further on the right. Well, how do I go about moving this text? Well, I'd simply select uh, the anywhere around the outside of the text box and you'll notice that the move tool pops up. So now it allows us to place this wherever we want all within our canvas also is the ability to actually rotate our subject which we can move in exact right angles just by holding the shift key um oop. there we go but uh this enables us to move it and then obviously just like any other object if we're to place it right here uh and then commit that we could then move this layer to the center or the bottom left or the top right in accordance to its bounding box. So it now interacts like any other layer. Uh, I really want to edit this text again. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click the text button and then I'll click within the text and it'll bring up the ability to change the font, to change the font weight, the size, bolding, that sort of thing, even the structure of the paragraph. So I'll just click, uh, click all for example, and then I'll just scroll using the scroll wheel on my mouse over top of my font section. And that will allow me to, in this case, preview a variety of different fonts as I scroll through. And I could change the font weight uh, the same way if I wanted to, or I could just select it, obviously. Um, I think I'm just gonna stick with, let's go with, yeah, let's stick with that one. Railway. 
and I'll change the font weight to say, let's go like a medium. Actually, let's go like way, way, way lighter. Let's go to a light font weight. And now, um, again, I could change the size simply of the text just by increasing the bounding box. And you'll notice that that actually adjusts the size within the size section here. But I could also uh, adjust the size by uh, changing the, the value. So if I wanted to select, in this case, select all of it and just change it to 250, we could change the size. Uh, Brooke asks, uh, font opac opacity. So yeah, so because this is a layer now, um, let's center it again. Uh, you can change the opacity of any layer, right? By just going to the a layer panel and then changing the font opacity right here. So it interacts like any fully, uh, fully adjustable, like totally non-destructive layer. In fact, actually we could even change the, um, the font uh, blending mode. So we could change this to like an overlay blend if we wanted to. So you'll see that areas of the font down where there's a little bit more color in the clouds adjusts accordingly. So yeah, I mean, this is the benefit of, of having this tool as fully non-destructive. Um, I personally love that. Um, and what else can we do within this? Oh, we can also change the font color if we wanted. Um, I could change it to like a light blue, which is probably gonna look a little bit silly. Yeah, sure is. But you can also change the font color by simply clicking on the font, uh, the color section and applying a specific hex code. So if I wanted to make this a very specific gray, for example, I could then input that gray just with the, uh, the custom panel here. So I'm entering E8, which is like an off white. Uh, there you go. Now, a bunch of questions came up about this and they're like, okay, well, well, what happened to like some of the font, uh, tools, like the ability to add like, uh, drop shadows and like, uh, beveling and all of these things. All of this exists still totally still exists. It's just, we moved it to the adjustments layers panel. So right down in the bottom right hand corner is the layer effects section. So if I wanted to add the layer effect to this, uh, I would just click this button and you'll notice that uh, the layer effects panel will pop up and it gives us a variety of different options. Um, let's just add a shadow, for example. So I'll click this section and I'll apply it. Uh, that looks really gaudy and gross. So I'm gonna reduce the opacity. Um, and then the blur distance, that's a bit better. Yeah, there we go. To so just giving it a little bit of pop. Uh, and then I can close that. And the benefit of this is, first of all, this, this FX can be applied to not just text, but any layer, but also the ability to obviously adjust that in the future as well. And the way I do that is simply by clicking on the FX button that occurs right next to our layer. So the cool part about this is if I was to, I don't know, we just place any layer. It doesn't have to be that. We just place a rectangle here. Um, let's do that. I could then make this tool. Oops, that's not what I want to do. Undo. Want to fill. There we go. If I wanted to apply the same effect to any object in this case, something as simple as like a box, you know. Um, there we go. I could do that very quickly, which by just clicking the FX section and choosing something. In this case, we could also shadow our, uh, our box here. Um, yeah, so it gives us the ability to now use that on anything, whether or not it be a picture layer or a, you know, some degree of uh, object that we've added or text or whatever. Um, okay, so I've got a couple more questions here. Let's see, what happens to transparent section of the canvas? Uh, da, da, da. I don't know. Is there an existing marketplace for ACDC development presets? How would we go about to create collections of presets on the ACDC preset marketplace? Oh, this is interesting. So that's sort of, okay, Thomas, this is a really big question, but um, actions is that, it literally is that. Um, this is something I'm sure will make everybody happy. So we've tried to put a lot of emphasis on the past, and currently what I feel like is there's, there was either, A, it was, it was poorly explained that you could share actions 
and that actions were something that were uh, readily available. Um, but like presets in ACDC, um, like that's what actions is and the ability to open up in this case our actions browser and import and export different actions and apply, you know, um, all of that functionality already exists within ACDC because actions are, are something that uh, anyone like yourself can open up and apply to or play rather on your images. This is probably the subject of a larger uh, workshop. So if that work workshop is something that interests you, I would love to talk about it in more depth and talk about like basically sharing custom application that you can make to um, any, you know, any image based on uh, stuff in this quote unquote marketplace that you're talking about. But all of this ability to, to make custom pres pre presets, save them, import and export them, 100% already exists within the software. And actually, I think ACDC would be pretty stoked if someone was like collecting and putting, putting together resources for, for this. But anyway, long story short, uh, that exists. I would love to talk about that in more depth in a, uh, in a, work, in a workshop. Um, so let me know if that interests you. Um, and yes, obviously, I mean, you're talking about presets within develop mode as well. Um, but I don't think presets are more powerful. I think actions are way more powerful than presets. But anyway, long story short, I can also, we can also talk about that. If you, that's something you want to see in the software, um, yeah, let me know. Please email me. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so still more questions here. Da -ba 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 -ba. Okay. Uh, Alan asked if I wanted to have a uh, L bold and then double size the rest of the text and then have the remaining text remain set. Can I select the existing L and make a change? Oh, so just like one letter? Uh, I believe that's possible. Let's try it out. Boom. Yeah, done. 100% possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, you don't need to put it on a separate layer. Um, okay. Uh, so I that's a lot about text. Uh, and also I've just derailed myself a little bit by answering a bunch of these questions, but um, let's move on to the next thing. Keep the questions coming. I'll answer as many as I can. Um, so we talked about the text tool. We've talked about snapping, resizing the canvas. We talked about rulers. We talked about layer effects. Cool. So another thing that is in re relation to um, uh, the question from earlier in regards to sharing is LUTs. Um, so let's discard this. I don't need this. Actually, you know what? Let's save this in ACDC file because I can open it up again if I want to. Let's just save it right here. So LUTs, right? Okay, so LUTs are really interesting. Um, ACDC added the ability to import and ap apply LUTs in the previous release, and we just added the ability to also export them so that you can basically create your own LUTs uh, within the edit mode section here. Um, and then uh, be able to pr present them basically and uh, provide them to other users. So a bit of history about LUTs. Uh, LUTs are lookup tables. Essentially, they're just a series of uh, blending adjustments to your image, but they have a neat history because, um, so from a standpoint of, uh, like a lot of modern filmmakers will use video LUTs to apply very specific granular, like detail, like lots of different sepia adjustments and just really interesting um, visual blending appearances to their, to their, their video uh, to get, uh, in this case, to replicate what was historically just the, the differences between manual film. Uh, film was often something that was very, uh, you know, uh, had a certain uh, appearance to it because it's, you know, subject to light and all of these things that changes uh, and different creators of, of film reel had, you know, used different methods and they would get different appearances to them. So when the process moved from, uh, from, from film reel to digital, a lot of uh, companies went to great uh, efforts to create um, the basically create LUTs, lookup tables that represented and they reflected 
what historically would have just been the idiosyncrasies of, of, of older film. So, you know, history lesson aside, uh, LUTs are really cool. So to make a LUT in ACDC that you could share with anyone, um, you know, what you do is you would make some adjustment layers. Uh, so in this case, I've opened up an image in, uh, in edit mode. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Vibrance and I'm going to actually, you know what, let's do this. I would like to, I would like to reduce the redness that I'm seeing here. So I'm going to open up Color EQ and I'm going to drop this purple bar maybe a little bit of the sort of mar a maroon bar down a little bit here. And the reason why is because I really want to get rid of the redness that appears on the outskirts of our image. I wanted to adjust that. Uh, and that's looking way better. Uh, then what I want to do is I probably want to pump up the saturation slightly. Oh yeah, perfect, there we go. And let's go through a slight dehaze adjustment on this image as well just to bring up a way more clarity, get a little bit more sharpness out of this area, the mistiness of the sky there, or uh, the light there. We want to get rid of a little bit of that. And then to slightly accommodate still for that redness, I probably do want to add a bit of a vignette, or rather further adjust the already existing present vignette. So let's change that. And so just adjusting this slightly, don't want it to be too gross. And so we'll just take a quick look at our before and after. So this is our original image, like weird chroma uh, chromatic aberration -y sort of redness that's appearing on the edges. And yeah, much better looking now. So I have a series of adjustments, one of them is which is a vignette, one, one is color EQ, one is dehaze, one is vibrance. And say I liked these changes and I'm like, okay, cool. This is, I'm excited about this. I wanna change this or rather save this now as a LUT, I can do so. So how I would do that is I would navigate to tools and I would create a LUT and the LUT is create base, created rather based on which adjustment layers I've added. So in this case, it would be four. It would be a vignette, a color EQ, dehaze and vibrance. So let's create this LUT. We'll save it as a 3DL file. We'll keep the quality at medium so we're not waiting too long while well, this saves. We'll describe this as a uh, rich dehaze. Uh, and I will not add a copy. I'm sure I'll add a copy right AP. There we go. Uh, save that. And then it's going to ask me to name it, obviously. And it's going to get automatically placed within my. Um, my section where all my 3DL and cube files are, basically where all my LUT files are. I'll just name it the same thing, call it Rich Dehaze and save it. And then so if I wanted to obviously present or provide this file to someone else, I could, and it would, as long as they have ACDC, they could run this no problem. Um, but the last thing I wanna do is just replicate obviously that effect. So say if we were to open up a different file, yeah, let's see how it runs on this. Go to edit mode. And then we already have that saved, but if we were to navigate to our LUT section here, it will just pop up. Uh, let's see here. There's, yeah, there's rich dehaze. And then we could see how that, uh, that LUT in this case looked on our, our image. So we can have a look at a couple different files here. Uh, but again, this 3DL file or this cube file can be provided to anyone and provide, uh, as long as it's saved in that manner or those file types, that's ACDC can read that and then present that. So if you were to, da, 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 let's see here. So that's how you would export it, but how we would import it is you could simply click on the, on the adjustment layers or you could do so from within the filter menu and it allows you to import that LUT from within, um, from within uh, ACDC. So it allows you to add it to your list here. Now, the other th cool thing about that, uh, which I think it sort of answers a question from earlier in regards to sharing as well, specifically from uh, develop mode, is if I go to develop mode, I believe we've added LUTs within this section as well, which kind of stretches the limitations, excuse me, 
of what you can do from within develop mode because there's a lot of functionality that uh, you would not have access to otherwise that you can um, you can now apply this rich dehaze that we've created also within develop mode as well. So you can import from here, you can apply these LUTs to your images, giving you like far greater control over your images than you wouldn't otherwise have within develop mode. So that's that. Let's have a look at some of these questions. Um, uh, Francis asked, are you recording? Are you gonna make this session, session available offline? Uh, offline, no, it'll be available on our YouTube channel though. Um, and yeah, so yeah. Oh yeah. I, everyone's like, there's so much information. Yes. It will be available on our YouTube channel. You can watch it on a later date. Cool. Okay. So there's a bunch of other questions. I'll probably have to get to a little bit after the fact, but there's two more things. And, um, the last two things are, uh, multiple image baskets, which is really quick and easy to show. And then just our blended clone tool. And also, guys, I appreciate it. There's like over 100, there was for many points in this workshop, over 100 people in here. And there's very close to 100 people in here right now. And I just, I'm stoked. Thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate that. So if you're an older user of ACDC, you will know about our image baskets. Uh, it's simply, you go to uh, rather, uh, let's see here, panes, image basket. Yeah. So you can bring up an image basket. Uh, we'll do that. All an image basket is, is like a, it's a location for you to temporarily place images that allows you to sort of move around with those images that, um, and, and edit those images from their non uh, hierarchical uh, area on the, your hard drive. That's probably very complicated, so let's just illustrate that. So I've got one image from this folder. I'm gonna bring in this big city guy. And let's say, let's go to a completely different folder and let's bring in this HDR image. And let's go to another image or rather another folder and just bring in, yeah, let's just bring in one of these. So I have three different images in my image basket. Now this image basket allows me to edit, allows me to bring these images up into view mode, do all of these things. Um, and that is independently of where they exist on the hard drive. So if I was to edit, uh, edit rather this image, bring it up in edit mode. First of all, the other elements with our film strip are located right down the bottom. So that's handy and allows us to edit those. But if I was to make any changes to that, they're, they're obviously witnessable from the image basket here, but it's also changes that image on the location of your hard drive. So it's basically so this place where you can bring all these images together so that as you work through, uh, you can sort of make these categories and it's a quick and fast location to go to. Uh, and the benefit of it as well is if I was to close down ACDC and open it up again, uh, these image baskets provided that I haven't removed the contents from them or removed the basket themselves, uh, everything is remembered. So all of those images that were in those image baskets are still there. They're presented to you as if nothing happened, right? So that's really valuable. So if I can go in and make another image basket here, now that we have more than one, we can add a new image basket and you'll notice that it pops up here and I could just go through and take all my bluish looking images, blah, 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 and add these to my image basket here. And if I needed another one, let's say here, let's add another image basket as well, you know, and separate the two. So I'll separate this image basket and I'll put on the subsection. Let's see here, red ish looking images. And then I can move from image basket to image basket with my section of images. So that at any point, if I wanted to edit these, I can go just go in very quickly and keep on adding to these and removing from these. Yeah. How do you select them so fast? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I guess I know what I'm looking for. <clears throat> um, yeah. So 
multiple image baskets enables you to flip through these and have quick and easy ready to access to these without disrupting their original location on your hard drive. So it allows you to edit, but still view them as sort of independent from those locations. Yeah, it's just faster too. If you're like going through and you're like, I, I want to select all my three images, but I only want to edit like, I don't know, maybe there's only six of these images that I'm going to send off to, you know, my, um, you know, for this photo shoot for the, you know, for whatever editor or whatever I'm working with. Well, I've got these, this, all my three images from one photo shoot in one folder, but I really only need to edit, let's see here, like, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six images, boom, throw them in the basket and then just edit literally from within the basket. Super easy. So, yeah. Um, and then lastly, the last thing I wanna talk about is the blended clone tool, which is just a quick and easy, cool addition to ACDC that allows you to make um, really, really uh, uh, structured, oops, uh, I went to the wrong file, because I'm a goof. There we go. So there's a couple different uh, um, repair tools. Um, in this case, we've always had the heal and clone tool. Uh, in the past, we've added the smart erase tool. Uh, but we've just added the blended clone tool, which we're really excited about. Um, so it sort of works similar to Smart Erase in that it's slightly adjusting the perimeter of your subject and placing in the similar manner to that how you would use something like the clone tool. And so when we go to make a selection uh, in blended clone, so I just literally went into repair in the edit mode, all I'd need to do is right click on my subject and then you'll notice it's producing a similar clone oops and I would go through and it's giving me grief there we go and I would start painting on this it's going a little bit slow because I'm also running a webinar platform at the same time there we go Oh, come on. It's driving me nuts. Hmm. Okay, this is a little bit slower than I would have like. Purely because we're recording our screen, presenting it to people as we're going. Yeah, it's not a great example. I'm gonna get out of here. Let's go back. Let's see if this works any better. Actually, let's use it in develop mode instead here. Da da da. Go into repair mode. Obviously, this is available. This tool is available in both. Let's see if this works any better or any smoother, rather. So I could take a section of my image and then just use the repair tool as I see fit. Sort of painting it on. And then when I go to finalize this, it'll blend as best it can in that area and try to get it to fit as seamlessly as possible. It's gonna take a second here. There we go. The only area I'm like not necessarily stoked, most stoked on is this area right here, but I could paint through and like try to accommodate. But you can see that I've sort of like smoothly added this section, especially up in the area right here where we're starting to see more foliage, like really fits in quite well. But again, you could just take certain elements of your image you can take your dog face and you can duplicate it and put it on, you know, you can sort of move these elements through. But in terms of correction, taking certain elements of specific images um, and like copying them and pasting them to certain parts, just to like give you a bit more greater control. Uh, I can see this being really valuable. Um, let's see if it works better on this image in develop mode too. Try this again. I want to really get this guy. I was kind of disappointed with that. Oh, way smoother. I don't know why that's the case, but. OK. 
Okay, taking our subject and quite literally replicating it in the best way possible. And it's gonna do our best. Now in this case, there's a little bit of a discrepancy in terms of if I'm just holding down right now, you'll notice that our subject has a, the outline in this case doesn't fit exactly with the background. But when we go to let go and have this be applied, it's gonna do its best to sort of smooth that in and apply a more gradual tra transition between that of the outline and the, uh, the subject. Watch that occur. There we go. So when I, we saw that, it's like there's no bold line around, there's no perimeter around this subject anymore. It just seamlessly blends it in with the background. So there's super, super value to this tool. Um, oh man, there's a lot more questions. Okay. Um, so that sort of concludes in regards to what we're talking about uh, topic wise for, for the video. So for any of you, uh, I'm just gonna stick around and I'm gonna see how many questions I can answer here. But uh, yeah, that covers everything for ACDC Photo Studio Ultimate 2020 that's, that's relevant and uh, new in this release. There's uh, way more that you can see that's new on our um, on the actual uh, product page itself. Just go to our website and check it out. But for the purpose of this video, these are the big sort of like very really visual changes that we can talk about. Um, but I'm gonna, there's like a good 15 questions I haven't even had a chance to even look at yet. So I'd like to take a look at some of these and answer as many as I can. Um, yeah, let's see here. Um, Uh, Tom asks, is there an automatic way to add image baskets? I believe there is a short uh, hotkey for it. So yes. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Big time. Wilbert, if you ever want to see, yeah, like, I guess this always comes up, but for any of you, I think it has come up a couple times during this workshop, but if you have suggestions as to what you'd like to see in the software, uh, please email me. I always send those suggestions to our developers. And then what happens is they get added to a list um, and uh, provided enough people have asked for a certain feature in the tool uh, that may or may not get implemented in the next version. So to me, I think this is a really awesome way to deal with your customers and also the, your user base, just because it's very direct. So uh, if you like Wilbert here or any of the other people that have mentioned previously in this video have something like that, just email me, email me. I'll send it to the developers. Do it all the time. No, that was not available to the public, unfortunately. Um, da, da, da. Uh, Art asked, any chance photo shelter would be added to the send function in the future? Um, I'm not sure what photo shelter is. I would say send me an email and I'll ask. Can you remove a single image from a basket as you color your images? Yeah, you can believe, remove any individual element. Let's just go back to do, do, do. I believe you just select the image and then delete, remove selected files from image basket. Um, uh, Douglas Christie asks, can you print to a Canon Image Proof Pro 1000 using ICC paper profiles? Uh, that's super specific. Uh, it's another one I have to ask the devs about. Um, Steve asked, what is the major benefit to using development mode over edit mode? Originally, I thought development mode was the non-destructive, whereas edit mode wasn't. Is that still true? It is still true. So there's lots of changes that you can make in edit mode that are destructive. The reason why I say it's non-destructive is because functionally, if you were to save as an ACDC file, which is very roughly very similar to saving as a Photoshop file, like you can edit everything non-destructively in the future. It's just when you're interacting with the filter modes in edit mode that you sort of enter the realm of um, destructibility. Uh, develop mode is a bit different. So it's uh, non-destructive, but it's non-destructive in this case to uh, raw files and it's non-destructive in a parametric way in the sense that everything you you make like you can adjust all of these elements 
you know, uh, uh, go back to the original image at any point. You can um, sort of reset specific boxes and all these things. You have like a lot of control over the non-destructive aspect of it, but specifically it allows you to, to be non-destructive to raw files. Um, yeah, so I mean, they're, they're both are, they both have elements of them that are non-destructive. Um, and, uh, but just for the, for the majority of people, I think they, they are editing images through the development suite. And for them to know that those functionalities are non-destructive is obviously really important. Um, I, again, like I'm a, um, I'm a graphic designer. So I, I come at uh, ACDC and I look at it from a graphic design perspective and having, be, having the ability to save images as a ACDC files and being able to uh, tweak specific components of your image and go back and make adjustments and uh, use masking and filters and all of these things to to functionally reproduce uh, non-destructibility is is really 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 important. Um, and so when I'm using ACDC for my specific needs, like all of the functions that I would ever want are non-destructive. I don't know if that answers your question. Hopefully, it sort of addresses the overall realm of it. Uh, so any changes, edits to the top, uh, uh, I don't know what that word is. Any changes, edits in the image basket will change the original file. Yeah, so when you edit something that's within your image basket, it's going to, uh, it's going to change the original file, provided you've saved those changes. The purpose of the image basket is to group images and quickly and easily be able to address them, basically. Um, oh, Bill, right, your question. I, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, okay. Um, <laughs> so you asked earlier actually about that. Um, lock image correction, sure. Let's do it. Uh, we had actually a guy talking earlier about presets and wanting to see uh, presets be something that that he could he or she could share with uh, other users. But your question is essentially just how do I how do I lock my settings in um, in develop mode? And that's very simple. Uh, so I would go into geometry and I would I don't know select the profile that makes the most sense. Let's just pick a random one. And then I would manual make make it maybe a manual correction. Then I would I don't know maybe I would rotate or straighten the image accordingly or something like that. But as you can see here, um, so there's some items that in this case you have a deactivated group, or rather you have an active group which is your lens correction, and you have an active group which is your rotate and straighten, um, and uh, your crop functionality here. So what you can do is really the ones we're talking about are the rotate and straighten and lens correction. You can save this preset and apply this to future images by just clicking on the save preset bu button here. Um, but if I save the preset from this knob, right, the one that's specifically nestled within the lens correction section, uh, it would just be the, um, the lens correction that's saved. In this case, I have a rotate and straighten and a lens correction. So what I want to do is save this overall preset from above here. So what I would do is I'd save this. Maybe I would call, uh, let's see here. Um, I would, in this case, I'm just going to select all. It's really geometry that are the ones that are being affected, but just for quick and easy use. And I would save this as a, let's say, lens and uh, rotate or something like that. I would give a name to this preset. If I hit OK, that preset is then saved. It's essentially locked. And all I would then need to do is click on another image. And I could run that batch development. Uh, so let's see here batch um yeah i want to batch edit that's what i want to do right lens rotate so i could then select any number of images and then just run this preset on a variety of images which would copy the settings that you used when you had your lens correction section it would copy the settings for your rotation and it would actually also copy any other selected when that big mode that uh, that big box comes up that allows you to select all the 
the little details in develop mode. That's essentially what this does. So it gives you a quick and easy way to just uh, save your selections and then pr present it and copy it and paste it to a variety of different other images. So that answers your question. Uh, there's also extensive workshops on develop mode. Uh, so if you've ever uh, wanted to like go over those and, and have a look, uh, there's more information on that. Okay, uh, it's been over an hour. Uh, I'm gonna close up this workshop. I know there's, there's more questions that I wasn't able to get to and for that I apologize. But if you have them and you really want an answer to them, uh, please send me an email uh, and I will get to them as soon as I can. And I'll often get our developers involved. My email is aprice at acdsystems.com. Uh, thank you so much for participating. I really appreciate it. We had like well over 100 people for most of this workshop. That's awesome. Um, yeah, like thank you. Um, I'll get to those questions as, as soon as I can. Uh, if I can get the developers involved, I will. If you have any suggestions, please send me them as well. Uh, yeah, and just thank you again. Um, I really appreciate you hanging out for the workshop. Thanks um, all. I think for the next workshop, I think we might be doing one with Alec Watson. So yeah, we'll talk to him. It's nice to get a um, actual photographer's uh, input in regards to this. I'm just a guy who really knows how to use ACDC, but he's a photographer. So he can tell you all of the ins and outs of all the beauty and the benefit of, of, of the software. So. Um, yeah, send me an email. Take care, guys.